This is Annabelle Goberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefervy, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Annabelle. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Good. Nice to see you, Joe. Good to see you. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, I'm just back to London after a frenetic weekend, uh, looking after all my plants. <laughs> I'm here and I am delighted that you want to talk. So what, what, what do you have in mind? Okay, let's get cracking. So um, as I'm sure you remember, we met through Charlie uh, Feldman in Paris. I think it was like uh, three or four years ago. Um, it was in New York, but yes, uh, we did. Really? Okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, that was the pre-Trump area where I actually uh, delved, like, you know, I, I, uh, I, I authorized myself to go to your country, which, uh, which I really like, but... Um, um, okay, so it was not in Paris, it was in New York. Well, well done um, for, the, for your memory. And I actually met Charlie through Brendan Bakshi. Um, do you know that, that guy? He used to work for um, BMI. Brendan uh, ran the BMI office. Sorry? Yes. He ran the BMI London office. For That's right. I think he left now, if I remember well. And he was also a neighbor because I'm based in uh, St. John's Wood in London. And I think he was as well. Actually, his kids used to go. Either him or his kids uh, used to go to the American school, which is like up the road uh, in London Street, London Street um, in, in St. John's Wood. So anyway, and I, I, yeah, and so I, I actually went through the motion. Like I, I, I uh, remember I met Brandon at a Medem uh, lunch in Cannes, which was really, really nice that he organized. And for some reason I ended up being invited. It was good. So um, yeah, so that's the connection. So since we're talking about BMI, how about we crack on and, and if you would please kindly explain to our uh, um, uh, you know, podcast listeners, what it is that you've been doing for the la- for twenty seven years um, at BMI for songwriters. You, you you did you did mention that in your in your notes that you kindly sent to me, and how thorough and um, and organized you are. Thank you so much. You're the only po- the only guest podcast guest who actually sent me some 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 pre podcast uh, notes. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Joe. But in your in there, you said that actually since you were coming from a family of publishers, you, you, since you've been raised in a family of publishers, you knew all about how difficult it can be for an artist to make money. So. Yeah, well, I can tell you how I uh, found my way to BMI, uh, and I can tell you what I did there. Uh, so where do you want You want to either start at the beginning, or do you want to start in the sort of like what I've prefer. actually did while I was there? Yeah, as you prefer. Okay. Uh, so uh, I uh, did grow up in a book publishing family, Annabelle. My father was an author. Uh, and uh, he was a best-selling novelist of suspense novels, uh, and um, he also was like the first well-known ghostwriter who yeah. got credit for writing works with famous people. Okay. Uh, so I grew up in New York City in the 1960s in uh, what I refer to as the Mad Men era, 
of uh, the, the wild and crazy 1960s in New York. And because uh, I've never watched Mad Men. What do you mean by this? Well, Mad Men is an amazing TV show on which you can watch on streaming, which recreates the advertising industry uh, world from the 50s and 60s. And they do a wonderful job of recreating what life was like in New York in that period of time, which was an amazing period of time. Uh, and so my parents knew all kinds of exciting uh, entertainment-oriented people. Uh, my father, for example, uh, uh, one of his books was H.R. Haldeman's blockbuster Watergate memoir. We're going, to, we're going to come back to this, on, on, but what, what did you mean by, we're going to come back to, uh, uh, to your dad's career in a sec. But what I, um, why did you say, from a money standpoint, why did you say that growing up in the, being raised in a publishing family, uh, it was difficult actually to see the money, you know, to, to monetize the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the copyrighted work, for example, of your dad, but also of your mum, because I think she was an actress. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, my father uh, would sell a book. Yeah. Uh, and get an enormous advance. That's and <laughs> he would have, for a period of time, lots of money. And, yeah. Even um, as a ghostwriter? Even as a ghostwriter. Okay. Uh, he was one of the first ghostwriters to get named credit and, and make big money. Now, but here's the thing. He, he didn't have a, a job with an income, so he would have big money for yeah. two years and then no income for three or four, you, you know what I mean? So it was, it's sort of like a feast and famine kind of a, a world. Wow. And, and you're a creative person. Um, and this has happened to entertainers and, and, and athletes and boxers who are in a similar situation. They make a lot of money for a deal or a, yeah. or, or, or a contract. But if you don't manage your money, you don't have any secure way of, of investing and you don't have, and, and you're constantly subject to being ripped off by consultants and bankers and lawyers and unscrupulous people. <laughs> so so, so your so, dad was the main brain winner at the time. Your, your mom was not, I mean, like, yeah, no, my mom, uh, uh, who is a beautiful woman who came to New York to be an actress. Uh, she ended up marrying my dad and having uh, two children. And she ended up being more or less of a homemaker. Uh, although she did okay. uh, a lot of community work. But yeah, so, so we would have, you know, really tough times. Oh, so you would actually uh, feel that as a child? Like, uh, oh, that, yeah. I mean, yeah. oh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, uh, so when I discovered BMI, when I was an associate at a law firm in Washington that actually did... I'm, I'm sure you can interject here, but your, your dad, right? He comes from the family, if I understand, because I Googled you, you and, and, and because you've got your dad's uh, uh, name and, and uh, I, I also saw some history about your, your dad, but also apparently your grandfather. So your grandfather was also named jo Joseph de Mona. Is that right? Yeah. That is born, correct. Born in 1901 from Camden, <laughs> New Jersey. Yeah. I, I read this. And is it true that he had like a very successful furniture business back back then? Is yes, my grandfather had uh, a furniture store in Camden, New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, and Camden in the 1920s was a boom town right. outside of Philadelphia, uh, a really thriving place. And uh, then, of course, years went by, and uh, it, it, it became sort of more of like a ghost town and a ghetto. So in my, ah. in my days growing up and going to visit my uh, grandmother in uh, Haddonfield, my, my dad grew up in Haddonfield, New Jersey, which is a lovely suburb of Philadelphia, a beautiful mm -hmm. place. But Camden itself became like a, a ghost town. It's a, uh, so your dad could not rely on the income from that furniture store uh, based in Camden to actually, you know, make, like, have a more uh, even sort of uh, income on a monthly basis. Couldn't rely yeah, on No, you're right. Um, actually, unfortunately for me, my grandfather, who was an amazing man, 
yeah. uh, passed away at a relatively young age. Uh, so I don't remember him. Um, he died when I was like three. Okay. Um, well, since your so father was born in 1923, um, in, and your, your grandfather was born in 1901, he, it means that he, he had your, your father at 22 years old, which is really young, but back then it was something that was quite common. So yeah, my, my, uh, I don't know, but then basically maybe he died young, but you also you also had some children quite quite uh, early in life. <laughs> yeah, no, he he did. They uh, they sent both their sons off to World War II to fight, which I you know I I mean, and without any idea whether they would come back at all alive, but they both did. Uh, fortunately for me. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but you know, it's a it's a the character of the people at the time, uh, understanding that you had to sacrifice uh, yeah. for your country, and uh, maybe was, uh, were they not drafted? Uh, no, they they enlisted. Uh, Hi, they, they enlisted. Mine. And my oh. father fought in the navy in the Pacific uh, and was in the invasion of Okinawa. Uh, I mean, like, the stories, the stories my dad used to tell about the war were. Just ripping and fascinating. Coming back to the money before we go into the wartime stories. So your dad had to rely on his um, a right of income, yeah, and in particular his advances. And for some reason, um, the his father's business was not really something he could rely on. He had to, yeah, he had to basically eat what he killed. And so, what about the royalties? Into so to explain that point about you being raised in a family where you actually saw how difficult it is for um, artists to recoup from the um, intellectual intangible assets. Why is it that he wasn't getting any royalties? How's that possible? Well, um, it's something that I wish I had paid more attention to when I was a much younger person and my parents were still alive, but. Uh, you know, the, the payment of royalties to authors is uh, a sketchy subject, whether you're a recording artist in a record label or whether you're an author and a book publisher. Uh, you know, you get an advance, you get royalties after they recoup the advance and any other costs. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he earned some royalties over time. But the beauty and the magic of BMI and the songwriter uh category was BMI existed to pay a steady stream of royalties for songwriters whose music is on radio and TV. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that royalty stream was steady enough, even if small, that it, it, it made it possible for many people to be songwriters as a career and not have to rely on the advance and the boom and bust uh, nature of uh, the entertainment industry, where you might sign a deal, get money, and then never see another penny. <laughs> right, right. So just for our listeners who are discovering this fantastically interesting field of music law, BMI is one of three collecting societies of copyright on uh, songs um, in the United States of America with CSAC, if I remember well, and the other one is... I can't remember the top of my head. ASCAP. Thank you. I remember it started with an A, ASCAP, Caesar. And BMI is, is, is uh, re relatively big with ASCAP. If I remember well, Caesar is smaller. Um, yeah. So, right. And what is the equivalent for writers of books, like such as your dad, um, to collect copyright on their on they, on they books, on their... On they, um, in the United States, which which collecting societies work for them in terms of royalties? There is none. Um, they, what? You you do your own deal with the publisher, and you it, it's it's uh, it's not a collective it's not a collective society kind of situation. I mean, collective well, it society. Is in it, it is in France and in the UK. There, there is a there is a collecting society for offers in in, in France for, uh, for sure. I'm actually registered as one offer there. So uh, so uh, unbelievable. So you have to do it everything yourself. I guess you could look at it that way, Annabella. 
That's a pretty tough wire, I mean, okay. Right, so, okay, so thanks for explaining the background about you knowing about how, how hard it can be for uh, um, an, an offer, an artist, to actually monetize his, uh, his or her intellectual property right. So that gives us a context, and that's quite important. Do you think it really motivated you in joining BMI for um, uh, songwriters song who are therefore in, this, in the music business? But do you think that this, this background, this family background, gave you... Uh, the, you know, wanted you to be like the uh, the uh, uh, the fighter of of uh, uh, right owners. Well, I think so. Yes, indeed. Um, okay. You know, when what what you need to understand about me is that growing up, I was passionate about music. Uh, I loved the Beatles, the Stones, the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, the Jefferson Airplane the band, I mean, all this music. I love folk music and the original blues artists uh, like the Chicago Blues and Elmore James and Muddy Waters and uh, Mississippi John Hurt. And, and, and all this music was uh, integral to my, my whole life. And then when I discovered BMI and I, I learned about their mission to pay royalties to songwriters. And then I saw it, it all kind of came to my mind. I said, what a wonderful thing this is. What a wonderful opportunity this is to work on behalf of creative people who I know struggle to make money. Yeah. Uh, and I, I used to say, I've done a lot of public speaking about entertainment uh, law and, and music in particular. And, and um, if, there, if there was a totem pole Annabelle in the entertainment industry about all the people who who get paid. The songwriter would be the guy who sits at the very bottom of the pole. He, well, especially she, in the streaming area, yeah. She is the last person to get paid. The director gets paid, the screenwriters get paid, the record labels get paid, the publishers get paid, everybody gets paid, and then the writer. And yet, and yet, Music is integral to entertainment. I mean, you can't obviously have a recording without a song. You can't have television programming and film without music. It, it, it plays a crucial role. So, so I was then able to spend my career fighting many, many, many battles on behalf of songwriters. Uh, Before to, we get, get into it. this, because I see that be before we get into this, into the battles um, uh, that you put on behalf of uh, songwriters, um, I see that you have a, a, a quite a, 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 um, a, a solid uh, music knowledge. Did you play an instrument and do you still play? Uh, the answer to that question is no, okay. but I'm told that I am very good at something called air guitar, Annabelle. I don't know if you know what the air guitar is. No. <laughs> is that the one on your, on your, on your mobile phone or something? <laughs> air guitar is... Uh, pretending you played guitar, ah. like, like this. I'm uh, afraid that doesn't count. That doesn't count. It, 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 it really doesn't. But but I want. I, there was a time when I was a teenager that I wanted to be a singer. Uh, you know, and uh, and to this day, I will say that I am the greatest singer in the world. When the shower is running, Annabelle, I am like <laughs> top five. But when the water turns off, you know, just nothing. Okay. Is that is that because you, you would define yourself as being an introvert or uh, or you or you, you find you, you see yourself as being an extrovert? What what do you think? Well, why is it that and in your shower you're okay, but then on the stage <laughs> maybe not? I I, <laughs> I I I don't know. I just um, I I uh, I don't know. I wanted to be a writer like my father growing up. Okay. Uh, who I idolized. I got sidetracked by a career in the law. If you know many writers, uh, writers can be a kind of a solitary profession, yeah. <laughs> and, and writers can be loners. Uh, so I, I probably have a little bit of that in my character. But uh, representing uh, creative people and songwriters, my goal as a lawyer was always to promote the client's interest to the maximum degree possible 
and promote the interests of my colleagues at BMI and all of the partners that we work with in the music industry in the United States, at least, you have to work together with the labels and the publishers and the movie studios. And often you have to have enormous coalitions because of why? Because you're going up against the well-funded media industries and streaming industries and retail industries and well, wealth. You, should, you shouldn't see, I mean, we, I think one shouldn't see them as being enemies. I think they are parts of a, of a sort of supply, like sort of chain, you know? And I think it's it's best to to see those actors of a of a chain of the ecosystem as as partners more than rather than enemies. But I agree with you that especially in the U.S., I understand that the um, telecommunications industry is, is, is a very potent, a very powerful lobbyist. And um, for example, you guys don't have um, neighboring rights for radio plays and. Um, probably TV plays and stuff. So, uh, well, well, of course, this is a given in Europe um, and neighboring rights are actually um, going up with streaming. So, but, but, um, so ha w w were you taking a rather confrontational approach in your lobbying uh, uh, with, for, for, for uh, songwriters um, uh, against the telecommunication and streaming uh, uh, um, actors and industries or were you trying to find more of a consensual Let's work together and find a win-win solution to this approach. Uh, I think that it's the latter. Um, BMI, which I no longer work for, mm -hmm. uh, but BMI has no interest in litigating with anybody. I mean, we always wanted to do a deal with our uh, licensees and our customers, uh, and we wanted to work things out with the broadcasters, whether it's a public policy matter or the tech industry. And unfortunately, though, uh, we were besieged and under attack uh, almost relentlessly. Mean? And the history is so fascinating and going all the way back. Hang on, hang on. Do you have some examples of being besieged? What do you mean by that, Sorry, That's pretty oh my good. How much time do you have, Annabelle? Just an example. How much time <laughs> is this <laughs> interview going to go on? I mean, <laughs> if, if you go all the way back to the foundation of BMI in the 1930s, it was created when the broadcasters boycotted ASCAP uh, for, over a royalty issue. Wow. And, uh, my... my uh, sense of it is exactly the sense that you just articulated, which was that I always felt that the big streaming services and the big uh, tech companies should realize how important music is to their overall product. Of course, they don't have they a should, content. They, 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 they should be happy to pay enough money that songwriters can flourish and write great new music. And, and yet, uh, they fought the royalties. They were, they were for, for decades, they brought antitrust cases against ASCAP and BMI to declare the whole business model absolutely illegal. And so battles were fought uh, on, on legality of the business model, that's antitrust law. Battles were fought in the rate courts about how much- Did they win? Did they win the antitrust cases or every time they got, they got just re um, rejected, repealed by the judge. How did that go? They, uh, the interesting, their uh, law of their history is, is quite interesting. There were a couple of victories. Uh, and actually, uh, the famous Supreme Court case uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, Annabelle, called CV C uh, CVS versus BMI, that is taught in law schools today. Awesome. The Supreme Court declared that the blanket license model was legal. Yeah. And um, it, it, it was remarkable that it had to go that far. For us in Europe, it's like in the UK, but, and also, of course, in France, it's a given. I mean, it's not, so, it's not something communication. And, and the, the, the first, the, net, like the networks, uh, mm -hmm. the networks litigated antitrust all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. Then the stations, TV stations, decided they would litigate the same issue. They lost. Then the cable TV industry litigated the same issue. They lost. Um, it, 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 it's, it's remarkable. So uh, what was I've, your role in these big battles? Were you the in-house lawyer working with your private practice? 
um, lawyer to actually prepare the case? What, what, uh, were, well, were you first hand involved in this, in these various litigation cases, or were you more like a, a front uh, a person yesing with the songwriters on the, you know, legal issues, collecting royalties? How was your? I mean, was the big the legal team big as well at B, at BMI? Yeah, so no, I, I came to BMI in 1992, Annabelle, after the antitrust cases were litigated. Right. Uh, so my involvement was working with outside counsel, uh, mainly on rates and money and royalties. Uh, and then, then there were a number of issues involving, when, when the internet came around, uh, a number of legal issues about what type of transmission is a public performance that BMI could license. Is it a download? Um, what is the nature of the exemptions under the DMCA safe harbors that, that permit big streaming services not to pay a penny? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I didn't get involved in the antitrust cases. They were before my time, but they mm -hmm. kind of set the stage for because they, because they upheld the legality of the blanket license, then the users had no place to go other than these rate courts that are created under BMI and ASCAP's consent decrees. So they could fight out what the rate should be in a federal court. So we had a number of... So is that in Washington, cases. usually? No, the, the, the rate courts of BMI and ASCAP are in the Southern District of New York federal courts down right. in Fulton mm -hmm. Square. But... That being said, I also spent a great deal of my career at BMI fighting cases in Washington under these compulsory licenses that Congress invented for non-commercial broadcasting or certain cable television rights or certain home taping rights. Uh, and there is a board there called the uh, Copyright Royalty Board now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are royalty battles there. So. Um, there, there were, um, and then I had an amazing career, and, and the internet in particular made it just like the first ten years at BMI were like dog years. You know, it was like twenty-five years in no a normal person's life. What do you uh, mean by that? Like you were really grinding the work, or was it just um, emotionally draining because the, you had some fuckers in on the other side who were ready to, to kill their mothers to win the case? It was, I mean, it I don't was, know. We so outrageously aggressive with these telecommunication, you know, uh, companies and uh, the streaming companies. I don't know. I don't really see Spotify being over aggressive, being Swedish and stuff, and so having you know this European sensibility to. Uh, right on his um, uh, royalties and rights. But what you are describing is uh, uh, like uh, uh, basically an attitude which is extremely um, um, antagonist and, um, and also doesn't take anything for granted because they, they, there doesn't seem to be a sort of uh, uh, like pool of common principles that, that um, the telecommunication companies and the songwriters' organizations would agree on in the United States. It seems that, uh, you know, all these antitrust cases, et cetera, you just mentioned, it's baffling to me that the, 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 uh, the uh, primary principles of uh, collecting royalties for, uh, for writers, for uh, right owners, seems to be uh, put into question uh, in America. Uh, so so what, why do I you think it was doggy years for the first 10 years? I, I think the answer is all of the above. Uh, the, the, the law changed. The law was unclear how it applied to internet transmissions. Uh, there were battles with peer-to-peer -peer transmissions where people like Napster said it should be legal for everyone to share all the music in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 there, there were untold numbers of issues that would be presented by technology. And if you're a, a follower of copyright law, you, you know that copyright law, the history of it is to respond to developments in technology. Right. And there's always a lag, and no matter what Congress can try to do, and the DMCA Safe Harbor is a classic example about this. They tried to write a safe harbor in 1998 thinking the internet would be one thing and not understanding that it would morph very rapidly into something entirely different. 
then the courts have to kind of apply the statutes to uh, the new technology. And, and, and it, it just became a tsunami of change and uncertainty and the new business models would pop up and disappear overnight. Okay. And uh, it, 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 it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time to be a lawyer. I mean, and I, I'm, truncating, I'm truncating 27 years, Annabelle, but I want to tell you that inside of those years, there were a great many of brilliantly talented lawyers and business mm-hmm. people in all kinds of industries who actually did have an idea to try to figure out a reasonable fate, get a deal going, set the stage for something to move forward. So, so the, the work that was put in was epic by so many people. And, and the other thing about BMI and ASCAP and CSAC to a degree, um, these collective societies work best when they're behind the scenes. You don't even know they're there. Mm. They, they're, they're not public facing. They give rights necessary to broadcasters and networks and streaming services and live concert promoters to be able to do what they do. And the fee is modest enough and it gets paid 90% out to the songwriters and publishers. And it's all seamless. It's when you're reading about them and hearing about a case, that's when the <laughs> friction has become too great mm. and uh, something as as litigated. So I understand there was a lot of firefighting, a lot of having to adapt to the technology and, and also all the um, the pushes made by the technology industry to, to, to make um, the content free or uh, uh, more, more easily accessible. But would you say that despite all the stress having to do all this firefighting, would you say that you think that your input into BMI's legal strategy and um, and uh, offensive and defensive um, has been, you know, useful and, and positive. I mean, what do you take out from this experience of 27 years of BMI? Did you really think that you actually won some victories or? Oh, we, um, you know, we, there's an expression, you win some, you lose some. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but let me go. Let me tell you that when I joined, can you continue saying this? Me in litigation, I never, I never lose. Have <laughs> we? Not seriously. Have we settled? Have we settled? Or I win, but I never lose. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I get that. Um, and <laughs> and when you're a lawyer servicing a client, you're only as good as your last case. So if your last case is a winner, you're golden. If your last case didn't come out so well, not so much. But, but when I joined BMI in 1992, the uh, president at the time was a woman named Frances Preston. Mm-hmm. Frances Preston was an iconic figure in the Nashville music uh, industry who became a global icon. Uh, and she uh, had a vision that she wanted BMI to become the world's largest performing rights society. At the time, we were uh, very uh, secondary to ASCAP when I joined. And when I finally left through the work of countless people and all pushing Francis's vision, uh, BMI had become the largest PRO in the world and announced, I think, $1.3 billion worth of royalty income this past fiscal year, and and the current CEO of BMI is a man named Michael O'Neill, and Michael O'Neill is one of the great champions of songwriters and creative people in in business today. And uh, so, so with an incredible vision and leadership, I think you, you need vision and leadership for any organization to cool. achieve anything because you look to the top to get your lodestar or, and, uh, and it was achieved, you know, and, and, and were there bumps along the road again, and it was achieved through the face of incredible opposition too. So, yeah, I can see but, that. but that being said, I think the broader music industry, mainly the record industry 
has taken enormous hits from the internet in the past 20 years. I mean, they, 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 compared yeah, to the amount of consumers. money that that they could have been making if there weren't. The consumer is uh, better off. I mean, I love having access to my Spotify, you know, membership and listening to music and having access to this massive catalog from there. I mean, maybe the... The business model had to evolve somehow because um, um, because it was it was inevitable that it couldn't go on with CDs and um, and vinyls and. <laughs> well, if, <laughs> if you want, I'll give you my take on that NFL, uh, which is, uh, uh, yes, Spotify is terrific. I yeah. mean, I absolutely adore it, um, but when you think about it that I can pay $12 a month and have access to every recording ever known to mankind, um, that is a paltry amount of money for the value of all creative works, not including my son, Matt Demona, who has his own music on Spotify and is yeah, great if you want to check him out. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and why? Why is it $12 a month? Um, but how many, hey, if it's nine, it's nine pounds ninety nine actually in the UK. But if it's nine pounds ninety nine, multiply millions, millions, and even billions of people. Hello, that's a lot of money. Yeah, no, no. Look, I'm not knocking it. I mean, it's 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 better than the current, the previous state of zero. Uh, so 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 there's money there, and I think the money there has given the record industry reason for hope and optimism. Yeah. I know the music publishers are very unhappy because they litigated to get an increase yeah. in the mechanical royalty, uh, and it wasn't that big of an increase. And then Spotify went to the court to appeal and have it overturned, which drove the publishers to absolute distraction. But um, it, it, if you didn't have the safe harbors that enable large streaming services to have every song, every song in the world can be on YouTube with no royalty obligation whatsoever. And at a certain price point, Annabelle, uh, someone would be willing to pay nine pounds a month for all music ever, but if you ask them for 15 or 20, then they're just gonna go and get it for free somewhere on one of these uh, hosted services like YouTube and not pay. So that has depressed the value of music generally. And uh, I think it's hurting the industry because songwriters who can't make money won't become songwriters. They, they, they will go into other fields, the great ones. And, and then ultimately the culture gets damaged because there's no great music being written and the, every, everything gets watered down. I think it's short-sighted behavior by the tech guys. That's my view. Uh, they, they, they're, in, they're in the catbird seat. They're making billions. The amount, the market value in some of these big tech companies is absolutely throughout the, the roof. Yeah. Unimaginable. It's and, a this is the new distribution channels. These are the new distribution channels. And songwriters are getting very small amounts of money. So I, I think, look, I think the business model could work if more money were shared. And, and I think like the European Union uh, issued a law that tried to uh, tighten the safe harbor so a large company like you could, the, could, the could take right? advantage of it. But the United States uh, Hasn't so much. The, the Copyright Office just came out with a report after three years long examining it. Um, and uh, I, I testified on a couple of those panels a few years ago. The, the law was supposed to be a balanced sharing, a sharing of obligations between the owners who knew their content and the giant internet services who were exploiting it. And, and it just became out of balance. There was no sharing by the tech services. They were just exploiting it. And the Copyright Office report acknowledges that the law has gotten out of whack uh, and is tilted unfairly against the copyright owners. But 
that's the good news. The bad news is it doesn't really sound the alarm that suggests some major changes need to happen. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think that that's a story that needs to be told and, 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 and that needs to be fixed in order for music creators to really get there. And then now, of course, here, here's another thing, live concerts in the pandemic, yeah. live concerts became the, 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 way the, the only way to make money in the US, in the US, recordings yeah. and publishing royalties and everything else were hammered down by the law and by internet and by piracy. But you could go out and make money, and now the pandemic, you can't, you can't make money. So it's 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 let's, tough let's, times, let's, tough times all around. And I, I, you know, and even though I'm not at BMI anymore, I, I will always advocate for creators' rights. And ability. let me break some good news over on the neighboring right side. Today, I learned that the European Court of Justice has um, <coughs> sentenced France the uh, two of the collecting societies for neighboring rights in France, so Adami and Spedidam, to actually distribute the um, uh, royalties of, um, for, for, for neighboring rights to U.S. Uh, performers. Oh, Exactly, because before what, uh, what the French collecting societies for neighboring rights would say before, hey, you don't have any, like, there's no reciprocity here. All our European French artists in the US can't get any royalties on neighboring rights, right? Because you don't collect them on, yeah. on, on TV channels and radio channels and, and bars and restaurants, etc. So why the heck do we redistribute the income to uh, your US um, uh, performers? And today, the ECJ has said, fuck you, France. You have to, uh, your collecting societies have to uh, pay. This is going to be a loss of 26, I think 26 million uh, euros. So what they are thinking of right now, uh, the journalist was saying, um, those two French collecting societies for uh, performers and, and, and you know, um, session musicians, etc. they have to merge because, because they have to, yeah, reduce their cost. To be, to be honest, I think this is actually good. <laughs> there are far too many collecting societies in France and they are far too inefficient. It's not like in the US, you know, there's no competition. Um, see that. Well, when, you know, in the US, uh, Annabelle, we have the three music collecting societies mm -hmm. for songwriters and uh, some of uh, the users. And now there's a fourth, actually, uh, a splinter or break off group of people who were created GMR because they didn't think the royalties were high enough. Uh, and uh, immediately, GMR was attacked for antitrust, uh, and, and uh, it, it, which is an appalling story in and of itself. But you know, the the broadcasters like, why, why are there two of these organizations? Why are there three? But really, the, the existence four. of competition among the societies has really been great because it's yeah. forced the organization to compete on overheads, to compete on technology. Mm -hmm. to make sure that they were streamlined and importantly to give the creative person the right to choose among exactly. options so you're yeah. not stuck with the government agency that you can't get anyone on the telephone to answer mm -hmm. exactly in europe we tried to be again the europe the, the um, brussels uh, uh, regulators have tried to do the same thing by uh, enabling a european citizen who is a um, songwriter or a performer to select another collecting so European collecting society, even uh, for a different from one from his uh, member state. So now, for example, you can be based in, the, in France and decide to go with PRS, which is supposed to be one of the most efficient in Europe. Uh, you don't have to actually register with SASEM if you want. If you want, you have a choice. So they try to open up the European market of collecting societies that way by making it possible to actually uh, register a collecting society outside your member state. So far, I'm not quite sure it's worked very well, but um, um, yeah, lovely. So um, you, uh, before you, um, bef you I, I read that on the internet, it was in your notes, I read that on the internet. Before you uh, joined BMI, I understand you worked for six years in a law firm in Washington, 
and that you were doing some regulatory work for electric and gas utilities before the FERC. So I've got two questions about that. What is the FERC? And second question is, does this experience um, inform your new pursuit um, on environmental issues and in particular climate change, this previous experience from your from your regulatory background in the, uh, gas and electricity matters. Is, is that useful for what you are doing now, Joe? Y yes, let me uh, thank you for asking about that. Uh, so when I got out of law school, my first job was at a law firm in Washington, D.C. that did regulatory work before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Right, uh, thank you. The yeah. FERC. Uh, yeah. What is the FERC? The FERC is a federal agency that oversees rates for interstate distribution of electricity and gas and oil pipelines. Uh, and so they're a very important uh, player in the energy law and regulation uh, field. Uh, it was at B, uh, that law firm that they happened to also represent BMI and have a communications law process uh, practice before the FCC, the Federal Communications, uh, including they represented the uh, the, the British uh, satellite group that that used to come to town. Uh, okay. At that, they represented BMI, and I got involved in BMI cases. And as we've discussed, I kind of fell in love with the notion of BMI. But my energy experience was quite interesting back then, and now. In my new life, post-BMI, I've decided to work on climate change, uh, and I have been working for the past eight months uh, with the Columbia Law School uh, Climate Change Law Center, wow. and we're drafting model laws on how to decarbonize the uh, atmosphere and various... Is that where you studied, Columbia? C Columbia yes. Law yeah, okay. I studied there and I met a professor, Michael Gerard, who is my guru of climate change. Uh, and uh, I really feel, Annabelle, that everyone today, in whatever field, needs to become a climate change advocate and person in any way they can. Because if you just look out the window and you see multiple hurricanes and the entire west of the United States on fire and droughts, yeah. epic droughts and 130 degree temperatures, you know, it, 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 if we keep burning fossil fuel uh, for the next 20, 30 years, you know, and, and, and massive immigration of peoples who can no longer, you know, grow food on their on their land. I mean, this is something that we all need to work on. We're working on uh, model laws. And I think that uh, one thing I've learned in the last few months trying to play catch up here is that environmental law is really energy law. They are entwined. Hello. It used to be environmental what environmental law and energy law have become one because it used to be in this country that environmental law was cleaning up rivers for toxic sludge and energy law was how much do you sell uh, oil for yeah yeah but now your energy law policy is your environmental policy yeah uh, and that, and that's causing that's uh, it, 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 it it's really opening the door, I think, for a lot of new economic activity in the world of clean energy and renewables and uh, electric vehicles and, and new jobs for people uh, and, and really new infrastructure projects, it, all with the clean energy then. So, so I'm doing that. Uh, so, hang on. Also, so, so what are you doing exactly with the, com the um, Columbia um, chair and committee in relation to environmental law, energy law. I, so, sorry, I interrupted you before, just when you were about to say exactly what it was the, on the agenda for this, uh, this, this, this committee. Yeah, so what I'm doing is uh, they've created a project to write model laws and statutes and ordinances in uh, state and federal and local environments on different industries about how to decarbonize Mm -hmm. Buildings, how to how to 
create infrastructure for electric vehicles, how to decarbonize your electric generation. And I'm just doing outreach. You know, I'm like, we, me and my colleagues, we're, we're reaching out to national and state organizations and, and, and non-governmental entities and non-for-profits. And we're, we're just trying to let them know this resource is there. The website was recently launched. It's lpdd.org. Uh, it's a what great website. Uh, what, does sorry? It, what does it stand for? Uh, LPD. It stands for Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization. Uh, LPDD.org. Uh, we've posted already 20 laws there. There's a lot of great stuff there. And we're just talking to people uh, in states and national organizations who are like, can you use these laws? What do you need? Uh, what are your priorities? And a lot is going to hinge on the presidential election in November, Annabelle, because if Joe Biden gets elected, he has this very forward thinking, aggressive plan of federal activity. If he should not be elected, then I think the locus of activity is going to have to be at the state and local level and in private practice. I participated in some seminars on climate week last week here in new york and you know amazon and google god bless them are Hang both on, before, we to this, decarbonizing. Yeah, before we get into this you mentioned that you were you were you had drafted some laws with the with this columbia um uh, chair i mean and, and committee but do you mean by that you drafted bills and that these bills you want to present to congress to be voted on is that the ultimate goal yes there are model bills, model laws okay. that could be presented to uh, Congress if they're federal or if they're state to state legislations, mm. legislators, or if they're local ordinances, it's a variety of things. Have you done that already? Have you started to present them to Congress or to other uh, states, uh, the equivalent of, this, uh, of the Congress in the states? Like well, we, 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 our activities to date have been an outreach mainly about state okay. and local governments because the Trump administration is repealing every environmental law that exists. Really? 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 Uh, so, so we haven't been doing any federal work, but uh, again, really remain, we're, we're at a, we're at a, an amazing time, Annabelle, in the history of the country. We're at an amazing time in the economy and the environment. And, and we have to be very hopeful. But on the state level, states can do quite a lot about their environment. They're in charge of electric generation. They're in mm -hmm. charge of building codes. They're in charge of some, the some. There's federal laws that overlay it. Uh, but, and that's an interesting aspect of the United States being, uh, you know, a federal state uh, compact where the laws, <laughs> you know, have to be considered uh, in different levels. Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited about it. I, I think that this is the fight that we need to make. We need to wage this fight for our children, for our children's children. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you have to get to the root of what's causing uh, illegal immigration. You have to get to the root of what's causing uh, uh, health hazards. You know, you, you can't just treat the, the symptoms, you know. Mm -hmm. So you were saying you, you actually attended this um, climate change symposium last week. So how did that go? Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm on the very surface of it, Annabelle, but there are a lot of activity by a lot of very important companies and businesses who are all, and, and I have to say, Europe is leading. Eating the charge. I mean, How to have you ask, actually? Are you, are you sometimes looking at the other uh, other models in Europe, but also be it in Asia or or Africa, maybe not? Uh, I mean, do you, are you also looking at what being what is being done on the other side of the pond in order to draft your, for example, your bills and, and your? Uh, we're not looking uh, for drafting laws in U.S. Uh, states, and we're not looking. Uh, overseas, but I certainly uh, am excited about the uh, uh, progressive thinking in Europe. And, and then there was an announcement last week 
by China. Okay. That China was going to try to uh, decarbonize their electricity. Not it's about the bloody time. Of- they have the worst polluter in the world with with your, with your country. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like it's uh, climate change. Obviously, is a global problem, and um, if they don't participate, that's a problem. But they they made an announcement, which was a pleasant surprise, even if it wasn't exactly what you might have hoped for. So. So it, it's, a, it's a new campaign, um, and one of my hopes and desires would be to enlist the support of songwriters and recording artists to help raise consciousness about this. I figured this would be a Great natural idea. thing to do because because artists and songwriters and, and the congressmen and women love the creative people to come by because it gets a lot of visibility for any issue that that they can support. Now, with the pandemic, who knows? Uh, uh, but you know, it's a great but, uh, idea because I must admit, um, when I listen to the content of uh, new artists like guys or, or ladies in their twenties today, especially in the rap but even pop um, fields, I'm like. Okay, so what is it exactly that they are talking about? What is the message here? Um, like, very often the songs, they don't convey any <laughs> deep message most of the time. I'm like, okay, so you're talking about your point with your dealer or the fact you actually lost your boyfriend. But it's all very egocentric. And although I, um, I must admit, I, I, I'm not really into the protest song I mean, for example, I, I, I went to see jo- uh, Joan Best during the Nice uh, f- uh, uh, Festival a few years ago, and I just couldn't do it. You know, it reminded me of all this la di that my mother used to say about the hippie years. I was like, oh, my God. And it's sort of uh, like, aesthetically, I really didn't like Joan Best's songs. Again, all the protest, like a woman still doing protest songs in the noughties is just... Um, no. So I think Bob Dylan did well to move on to electric and to stop protesting with all protest songs because, you know, we had to move on. But however, now we are on the other side of the spectrum, on the other side of the pendulum, where most of the songs I listen to are basically, as you were saying before, bland, middle of the road, and with nothing more than just being very egocentric about who you um, have sex with, uh, (laughs) what drugs you you do, and there's there's no message, there's nothing, it's empty. And and I think that's a shame. So even for uh, songwriters, I think that would be uh, good to actually raise, you know, the bar and get some content and output out there, which while not going as far as being a protest song, because I think that's really outdated, um, is it, it, is a bit more, you know, um, how can I say, is a bit more interesting to the rest of the world um, than just your, your story about your breakup with your boyfriend and how difficult it is to find your dealer, and, you know? Yeah, I think, I think that you're right. And um, although I love the folk music tradition uh, and the traditional protest songs and uh, the passion and the awareness and the community that that developed. Well, you're a child uh, of the 60s. Of course you like that. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I am. But uh, uh, I, I also think that when you look at artists, and this goes back to the problem of not paying enough royalties, Sanibel, um, an artist, a great artist, will develop over the course of his or her career. And for example, the Beatles started out singing, you know, bubblegum pop songs from girl groups in the 50s. And and then they evolved to writing some of the most profound uh, music around. Uh, And, 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 uh, you know, you you, you have to nurture an artist and you have to give them opportunity to grow emotionally and to grow spiritually. Let's just take Taylor Swift, for example. Uh, Taylor Swift's uh, songwriting is growing in very important and introspective ways uh, compared to the pop songs that she wrote to get to the, you know. Do you have uh, an example? Uh, I don't have any examples. Well, you for think you she's more deep? <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I just think that 
that artists need to be, uh, you know, nurtured. And I think jazz is a music that I've come to listen to a lot more in my advanced age. Uh, and and uh, jazz artists, uh, they can they can have lengthy careers if they make enough money. Uh, and um, you know, the great American songbook, the songs from the 30s and uh, the 40s and the 20s and the chanson francaise. I, I mean, like, like you, you, can, you can develop and you can have an impact culturally and socially uh, as long as you're making some money. And this is where it all gets back to just the yeah. raw economic uh, sharing of the benefits. Who's pocketing all that money? Um, I think when they drafted the uh, DMCA, uh, Congress didn't really realize that these tech companies would be able to use music as a loss leader. They could give away the music, which they had free access to, in order to attract eyeballs to their websites so that they could make money selling them products or selling search advertising, or in the case of Apple, selling devices, um, they, or, or in the case of, of Facebook, selling ads to them. They, they, the music was a loss leader giveaway, and there, were, and, and there was no value being paid. So uh, I, I think all of that made them a fortune. But it's short-sighted for them even, you know. Yeah. And I think if, if you're saying from your chair, you think music is bland today, I worry about that. I worry about yeah, I, I, I do. not having great artists. And I worry about not having the next Bob Dylan. And I worry about not having next Joan Baez, who was terrific, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and no, I think it's just like the high-pitched voice, which it, it doesn't work for me. But, a bit like, um, yeah, it, it just didn't really work for me. But... Um, no, no, she's a, she's an extremely talented uh, uh, guitar player, that's for sure. But um, yeah, okay. So thanks for this, um, and and I think it's a great idea that, as you were saying, trying to mix the two, the climate change lobbying and and work, and also trying to have artists involved in that. It's a great idea. Um, now, if we take a, um, a, a step back, so. You said you said you said before, but I'm going to ask again. Sorry. So, where did you grow up? I grew up in New York City, uh, in Manhattan. Okay. On the east side. You said you you had you you had a sibling. My sister uh, Darcy. Um, Darcy. Older okay. sister. She lives in Rome, Italy. Uh, oh. and I have an Italian nephew and a niece. Okay. Um. And Rome is an amazing place, the Eternal City. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, like my it. sister uh, knowingly inherited the writing talent from my father that I didn't get. But uh, you know, somebody's what? got it. <laughs> what are you saying she's a writer, professional writer? Uh, well, what she's doing, uh, she teaches English. Okay. And she also translates uh, for the Venice Film Festival and for other. You know, also company. She 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 has uh, a creative life of her own. And oh, if I, I, I go to the, I feel like I need to get over there some more. I mean, but now travel is very difficult. Oh, if if I go to the Venice Film Festival one day, which I really want to do, it's in September. It's one of the best with um, Cannes, obviously, in Toronto and Berlin. Um, I'll um, I'll um, ping you so that um, I uh, I can meet you. Sister. Look up Darcy. Yeah, and um, so, um, so, so, how how is it? I think this is more of um, of, of an American tradition. But how, so, your grandfather was called Joseph, your dad was called Joseph, and yourself you are called, called Joseph. Is that like an American tradition to name the firstborn um, uh, male child like the same name as the the, the father? Or? I you know I don't know that it's an American tra tradition. Uh, but I imagine it's it's customary. Um, I, I uh, we all had different middle names, okay. so um, so I was not. We weren't a second and a third, you know, like Roman numbers, because we had different middle names. <laughs> but so which uh, one, which uh, ones are yours? Uh, my middle name is John, which is named after my uh, 
grandfather's brother who was a judge in in okay. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, but but when I when when we had my son Matthew, uh, I said to Lisa, I said, Stop. you know, three Josephs is yeah. enough. Let's give this guy his own his own era, name and his own personality. Yeah, it's a different era. Yeah. Where um, where are your ancestors coming from in Italy, the Dimona? Where are they from originally? Uh, my Italian family is from the southern part of Italy, uh, a small uh -huh. town in the mountains. Um, and they came here around the turn of the century. Okay, so where about exactly? Which mountains? The Abruzzi? <sighs> I'm afraid that I won't be able to tell you exactly. Oh, really? Uh, but my sister knows, and she's been there. Uh, and uh, my mother's family, on the other hand, are Scots Irish who okay. came to this country in the 1700s. And I have a direct ancestor who fought in the American Revolution and won in the War of 1812 and won in the Civil War. Uh, and I think that counts. Uh, I, love, I love to think about, I love that the Scots Irish are fighters and uh, passionate people. And I just, the history <laughs> there is so amazing to think about, you know. Uh, what their lives were like, you know, and, and the formative events of this great country of ours, which I think is still great despite the struggles and the travails. But I mean, you, we, we like to look around, oh my God, things are so difficult now. But boy, the Great Depression, the Revolutionary War, you know, I mean, the Civil War, the amount of people who died in the four year period, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And people, People, you know, made it through. So what, was the through. what was the motivation of your family members to move um, from Italy to America? Was, was it to basically make a living? Do you think that that was the... Um, I'm sure. I, that. I, 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 I'm sure that's what it was. I mean, a lot of Italian immigration, uh, Eastern European immigration, Germans, Irish. I mean, like, this whole, this country was founded on immigrants. Yeah. And that's why it's so disappointing to me to see the current government's anti-immigrant uh, uh, policies and, and like America first. Well, what really is America, Annabelle? America is a warm embrace. It's the Statue of Liberty, which was a gift from France. I mean, France, I went to my junior year in college in Paris because France is so important to the this country. I mean, it was Admiral uh, Rochambeau, whose Navy uh, helped um, win the, the Revolutionary War against the English. There wouldn't be any America, you know, without the French. And, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's giving people an opportunity. That's what it's all about. So. I, did, um, I did a DNA test two or three years ago with 23andMe, which is a, a, a company based in, out of California, um, driven and, and managed by the ex-wife of uh, Serbe Green, uh, Serbe, a guy who is the co-founder of Google. And through that, I discovered that 50% um, of my DNA is actually Italian. I mean, really? I can't believe it. <laughs> And um, and so basically, and, and it, it's interesting, 23 and Me res results, because you actually know exactly where they're coming from. So apparently there's a bit of, you know, of DNA from Sicily, so obviously the South. Um, I know my great-grandparents were from uh, Alessandria, which is in, um, in the North, uh, in Piemont. And uh, I remember my grandmother on my mum's side saying, because it's actually my mum's side, which is Italian. Um, and my mum, grandmother from my, uh, of, of, so my mum's mum, saying that her father left, um, sorry, a grandfather left to go to America and he left his wife with, I don't know how many kids, um, uh, by themselves. So um, my grandfather on my mum's side had to leave school at nine to actually become the, uh, the breadwinner of a family and um, started building roads and stuff. And then what happened is that, um, so he became quite a successful entrepreneur, you know, starting at nine years old, his career, <laughs> sustain his family uh, in, 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 uh, in um, 
Piemont. And um, when the fascists came on in the um, uh, came to power in the 30s, he was actually uh, tortured um, by the um, camicie nere, the black shirts. Um, uh, they made him drink the. They, they basically um, um, ad- abducted him and uh, made him drink the um, resin oil and stuff. So um, when he was released, he took his uh, wife, his nine kids. He said, "We moved to France." And that's why we um, and they moved to Agen, which is in the southwest of France. So that's why uh, uh, you know I, I and like we established. <laughs> France, so so yeah, it's it's, it's quite interesting. But uh, I think you should have a conversation with your sister to know exactly, you know, where in Italy your family is coming from. The Dimona. Well, I, I I know I just don't want him to speak on online here, but I can tell you. I'll I'll give you the particulars, and you you'll be interested to learn what she knows. She she's she's the best one to. She she's lives there, and she's been down there, and she just vacationed in Sicily. Um, she's a great traveler who will take 10 hour train rides and go up mountainsides and try to see every little nook and cranny. She's, she's really a wonderful person. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crefervy Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you.